Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti a questo incontro di Incroci di Civiltà che ci sposta a nord, un po' più a nord dell'incontro precedente che era fra Turchia e Germania, siamo ancora un po' più a nord, Svezia e Norvegia, è un incontro che ormai fa parte da molto tempo della tradizione di Incroci di Civiltà, è un incontro tra due scrittrici e anche tra due editori che voglio ringraziare fin da subito, la casa editrice Marsilio che è uno degli partner e sponsor di Incroci di Civiltà e la casa editrice Perborea che è uno degli amici più cari di Incroci di Civiltà e che voglio salutare con particolare affetto, grazie di essere qui con noi come sempre. E grazie Emilia di essere qui con noi, grazie Cristina. E questo incontro, come, sta, come dicevo, è un incontro che ormai è una tradizione eh, in incroci di civiltà, questo andare appunto nel, nel nord, ma è un incontro che fa parte de dello spirito di incroci di civiltà e sarà un incontro, come sentirete, anche eh, legato alla tematica del viaggiare e quindi appunto vi faremo viaggiare. Mi fermo qui e lascerò dire alla, a Pia i nomi. Eh, i nomi, eh, non li dirò io così mi, è, mi evito errori di, di pronuncia eh, non, eh, infatti a te allora, eh, permettetemi qualche anno fa c'è stato per un momento una cosa che si è chiamato premio Ava per la cultura lo ricordo perché appunto è vero che Iperborea c'è appunto eh, a incroci però Emilia Lodigiani non è che c'è sempre a incroci, anche se so che vorrebbe, quindi Emilia Lodigiani, voglio dire, Iperborea è la, la sua creatura, per cui noi siamo felicissimi che sia qua, veramente. Un applauso per piacere. Marsilio è vicinissimo al nostro cuore perché è a Venezia e quindi c'è, come dire, è così vicina a Incroci che è un partner, quindi voglio dire Francesca Varotto che è sempre così ricca di suggerimenti per noi. Siccome svedese è legato alla persona che si metterà qui nel mezzo, beato tra le donne, che è il professor eh, Massimiliano Bampi del Dipartimento di eh, Studi Linguistici e Culturali Comparati, permettetemi appunto di sottolineare il fatto che nonostante non sia il suo settore disciplinare, è il docente che ha portato lo svedese a Cafoscari e l'ha fatto crescere, vedo molti suoi studenti in platea e è riuscito a farlo crescere così tanto che adesso abbiamo anche un altro docente incardinato che incontrerete nel prossimo slot, Massimo Ciaravolo, traduttore soprafino tra l'altro, e quindi non posso che ringraziare Massimo che, eh, Massimiliano che è anche lui sempre disponibilissimo a salire sul palco per incroci e a incrociare gli autori che queste due case editrici ci, ci propongono. Quindi, Massimiliano Bampi, dato che in mezzo lo cito per primo, e poi naturalmente Erika Fatland e Elisabeth Osbrink, venite qui, you're welcome on stage. important mission to begin with reading in Swedish the beginning of my book 1947 Tiden går inte riktigt som tänkt Den 1 januari 1947 skriver The Times att britterna inte kan lita på sina klockor för att vara helt säkra på att tiden är vad den utger sig för att vara bör de lyssna på BBC som ska sända extra rapporter om vad klockan verkligen är. De elektriska uren påverkas av de ofta förekommande elavbrotten, men också de mekaniska klockorna måste ses över. Kanske beror det på kylan, kanske blir det bättre. Under kriget har nära 50 000 ton bomber släppts över Storbritannien. Över 4,5 miljoner byggnader är skadade. 
Mindre städer på landsbygden har nära på utraderats som den skotska hamnstaden vars bombattacker till och med fått ett eget namn, Clyde Bank Blitz. I den österrikiska staden Wiener Neustadt stod en gång 4 000 byggnader, nu är endast 18 intakta. I Budapest är hälften av husen obeboeliga. I Frankrike har sammanlagt 460 000 byggnader förstörts. I Sovjet har 1700 mindre städer och byar total förstörts. I Tyskland har runt 3,6 miljoner bostäder sönderbombats vart femte hem i landet. Hälften av hemmen i Berlin är obeboeliga. I hela Tyskland är över 18 miljoner människor hemlösa. Ytterligare 10 miljoner är hemlösa i Ukraina. Alla måste de klara sig med begränsad tillgång till vatten och sporadisk tillgång till elektricitet. Mänskliga rättigheter finns inte. Knappt någon känner till begreppet folkmord. De som överlevde har just börjat räkna sina döda. Många reser hem utan att finna det. Andra reser överallt utom dit varifrån de kom. Europas landsbygd har röjts, skövlats och ligger bitvis under vatten efter att dammar saboterats. Odlingsmark, skogar, bondgårdar, människors liv, mat och arbete ligger under aska, täckt av lera. Grekland har förlorat en tredjedel av sin skog under den tyska ockupationen. Över tusen byar har bränts. I Jugoslavien har mer än hälften av boskapen dödats. Och plundringen av spannmål, mjölk och ull har lagt ekonomin i ruiner. Inte bara har Stalin och Hitlers arméer skapat förödelse där de dragit fram. De har dessutom beordrats att förstöra allt i sin väg när de retirerat. Den brända jordens taktik skulle inte lämna något kvar åt fiendens trupper. Med Heinrich Himmlers ord, inte en person, ingen boskap, inte ett vetekorn- inte ett stycke räls får lämnas kvar. Fienden ska finna landet helt bränt och förstört. Nu, efter krigets slut, söker alla efter armbandsur. Själ gömmer, glömmer och förlorar dem. Tiden förblir oklar. När klockan är åtta på kvällen i Berlin är den sju i Dresden, men nio i Bremen. Rysk tid i den ryska zonen, medan britterna inför sommartid i sin del av Tyskland. Frågar någon vad klockan är svarar de flesta att den är borta. Klockan alltså, eller menar de tiden? Buongiorno a tutti, è un grande piacere essere qui, è la mia prima volta a Venezia. Adesso leggerò un po' del mio libro Sovietistan in norvegese. Po sette mitt, sette sutten f, satte alt en myndig middelaldrende kvinne i lilla kjole. Det må ha skjedd en feil. Dette er mitt sete, sa jeg på russisk. Du vil vel ikke skille tre søstre, svarte kvinnen, og nikket mot de to matronene i nabosetene. De var til forveksling lik henne. Alle tre så oppmerksomt på meg. Jeg fant frem om bordstigningskortet mitt, pekte på nummeret og så på setet. Dette er mitt sete, sa jeg. Du vil vel ikke skille tre søstre, gjentok den myndige. Hvor skal jeg sitte da? Dette er som sagt mitt sete. Du kan sette deg der. 
Hun pekte på et ledig sete foran oss. Da jeg åpnet munnen for å protestere på ny, så hun på mig med blikk som sa, «Du vil vel ikke skille tre søstre?» «Det er ikke et vindusete», mumlet jeg, og satte mig lydig på setet den myndige hadde pekt på. «Jeg ville jo ikke skille tre søstre.» «Fremfor alt ville jeg ikke sitte fire timer alene ved siden av to av dem.» Da den rettmessige innehaveren av setet jeg var blitt henvist til dukket opp, sendte jeg ham videre til de tre søstrene bak mig. Mannen ga straks opp alle forhandlingsforsøk og gikk for å se sig om etter et sted å sitte lenger bak. Da flyet takset bort etter rullebanen, valset fremdeles fire forviste menn rundt i midtgangen på jakt etter et ledig sete. Jeg sovner vanligvis så snart hjulene letter fra rullebanen, men denne gangen fikk jeg ikke blunn på øye. Sidemannen min stinket av gammel fyll og smattet høylytt i søvne. Den høyreiste kvinnen ved vinduet trykket utålmodig på tv-skjermen foran seg. Selv om hun ikke fant noe som interesserte henne, ga hun ikke opp og trykket hissig videre. For å få tiden til å gå, bladde jeg i den nette lille turkmenske ordboken jeg hadde tatt med mig Til språkene som snakkes i de øvrige fire landene jeg skulle til, fantes det omfangsrike Lær deg selv-kurs med tilhørende tekstbøker, øvelseshefter og DVD'er. Og i et anfall av overmot hadde jeg kjøpt alle sammen. Men om det turkmenske språket hadde jeg bare funnet denne beskjedne lefsa som halvt var ordbok, halvt overlevelsesguide. Den siste halvdelen var viet nyttig fra seg som «Er du gift?» «Nei, jeg er enke.» «Jeg forstår ikke. Vennligst snakk langsommere.» Gradvis introduserte forfatteren leseren for eventualiteter og problemer som kunne tenkes å dukke opp på reiser i dette landet. «Hvor mange timer er flyet forsinket?» «Virker heisen?» Vennligst senk farten. Avsnittet om hoteller går grunn til bekymring. Toalettet er tett. Vannet er stengt. Strømmen er godt. Gassen er stengt av. Det er ikke mulig å åpne, skråstrekk lukke vinduet. Aircondition virker ikke. Fra disse generelle, men ufarlige problemstillingene gikk forfatteren så over til å dekke en rekke krisesituasjoner som kunne tenkes å oppstå fra stopp tyven og ring en ambulanse til mer allmennyttige fraser som «Jeg gjorde det ikke» og «Jeg visste ikke at det var galt». Helt mot slutten tog et kort, men viktig kapitel for seg tema «Checkpoints». Jeg pygget «Ikke skyt» og «Hvor er nærmeste internasjonale grense?» og la vekk boken. Kvinnen i vinduset hadde gitt opp å finne noe av interesse på skjermen og satt og snorket med åpen munn. Jeg ble sittende og se ut på den rødmende kveldsimmelen. I løpet av de neste åtte månedene skulle jeg besøke fem av verdens nyeste land, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan og Uzbekistan. Da Sovjetunionen gikk i oppløsning i 1991, ble disse landene for første gang i historien selvstendige stater. Siden har vi hørt lite fra dem. Selv om de til sammen dekker et areal på over 4 millioner kvadratkilometer, og mer enn 65 millioner mennesker holder til der, er denne regionen fullstendig ukjent for de fleste av oss. One of the good things about working uh, here in Venice at Kafoska is that I get the opportunity of reading lovely books like the ones you wrote. But before delving more deeply into the books themselves, I think it would be useful to have to say a few words about each book. So how did the idea of, of this book, of your books, come about? Shall I go first? Uh, well, um, I was doing research for a completely other book. I was wanting to write a book about the Swedish fascist leader, uh, Per Engdahl, and I was looking for information, keys. When you write about a person, you need keys into his or her life and work. 
And I had found one of these keys in a book of Stieg Larsson, you know, the writer of the Millennium books. He used to, before he wrote the Millennium books, he wrote books about right-wing extremists uh, in Sweden. And there in one paragraph, uh, he says that this Swedish fascist leader, Per Engdahl, in 1947, went to Denmark to start a Nazi party, which is a quite astonishing thing to state. Two years after the war is over, go to Denmark, which was occupied and hates Nazis, and start a Nazi party. So, well, I had met Stieg Larsson. I know he was very thorough, but he had no source. I didn't know how he knew this. So I started looking for confirmation in different archives, and I couldn't find it. And finally, I decided to read two major newspapers in Sweden from day one to day 365 to see if they had captured this. Uh, they hadn't, but this year sort of developed in front of my eyes day by day. And um, I had to change my mind. I saw this was a very decisive year in so many ways. So Per Engdahl became one of 20 threads in this story about a year instead. Well, I think for me it actually started with a title, Sovjetistan. It just came to my mind and I thought, well, that's a good title. And then I checked, is there a book with this title? No. And then I thought, okay, I will write it. Um, and I have been working with Russia and the former Soviet Union for many, many years. And I'm deeply fascinated by this part of the world. For us in Norway, Russia is a neighboring, it's a neighbor country, but it's also, it's completely different from, from Norway. It's, a, it's another world in so many ways. And I wrote my master thesis and my first book about the uh, hostage crisis in Beslan in the North Caucasus in 2004, when a group of terrorists took a school. And, but the North Caucasus is also a very interesting part uh, of Russia, because there are not so many Russians living there, but a lot of different people. And then I realized, that, for real, that, that Russia and the former Soviet Union was, of course, made, of, made up of a lot of different people. And I think probably the people who were most different from the Russians were the people living in uh, Central Asia uh, before the Russians came and, and the Soviet Union became a reality. They really, they were nomads, they didn't have a state, they were Muslims, everything was so different. And then they became part of the Soviet Union and they were modernized extremely quickly. But now they have been independent for more than 25 years and still I knew nothing about those countries. I had seen Borat and that was about it. Uh, so, I guess the simple and easy answer is also curiosity. I was curious uh, what has happened to those countries and what is it like to travel around there? You were both curious. I was curious as well as a reader because when I got the opportunity of reading both books, uh, the first thing that I tried to, um, the first answer, uh, question that I tried to ask myself was, is it possible to find some sort of uh, um, common ground in approaching both books? And of course, there is more than just one path into the stories. Uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about um, reading both books together at the same time is that um, they, they build up a, a dialogue and they contribute towards uh, um, creating some sort of meditation on time because they are both about what happened in the past one year and then the consequences of what happened after that, what happens today in five uh, countries that um, are not uh, in the very, at the very center of the international attention. So do you think, how, to what extent do you think this kind of uh, uh, journey uh, across time, through time, back and forth, can um, shed a new light on uh, on the consequences of uh, recent history 
during the 20th century in the countries and in the cultures I have uh, um, analyzed through your books. I leave you to answer first and then I will think. <laughs> I thought you, I would do the same this time. <laughs> I answered first last time. Uh, well, I have this quote in the very end of the book, which is actually a key to the way I think, and it's, it's William Faulkner, it's from a play that he wrote, which is, it goes like this, the past is never past, it's not even dead. Uh, and that is sort of something that I'm living with in all my work, uh, because, and, and especially this, uh, of course, because when I read about Europe, what I just read about the devastation, Europe was a ruin, and it's only 70 years ago. It's, it's not even a man's lifetime. And all these things that we now have, uh, democracy and uh, the human rights, and uh, also uh, feminism, and a lot of things that we deal with, jihadism, denial of Holocaust, all these things actually started here uh, in a lot of ways. And in that sense, the past is never past. It's never gone. It's never dead. We live as if it's gone, but it affects us uh, in so many ways. And I try to, I hope, capture that. Time is interesting, of course, for all writing. Uh, I can talk for ages about that, <laughs> but I leave. Well, as Sovietistan, it's both, as you said, it's a travel in the present, but there's also a travel into the past of those countries. And for me, some of the most fascinating research was looking into the past. And it's even fascinating just with a name, Central Asia. Because, well, if you look at the map, it's, it's rather central, but politically, economically, it's not central anymore than far away. Istan is actually a better, would be a better name. But, say, 1,200 years ago, during the age of the Silk Road, Central Asia was really central. It was the hub between uh, China and, and Venice and Europe, and every caravan, caravan would pass through and also, uh, especially today's Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, uh, it was center of the Muslim world, and they had a huge paper industry. Books were really, really cheap. Uh, they were like throwing books at, at the buyers at the market, and everyone was, or a lot of people were reading Platon and Aristotle. And what were we doing in Norway at the time? Well, eating mushrooms and carving in stones. Uh, so, so they were so advanced, and a lot of what you learned at school, algebra, for example, originated in Central Asia. And then came Genghis Khan, which was a devastation for Central Asia. We killed so many millions of people, we don't know who, how many. And then Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to Asia, and then Central Asia wasn't central anymore, and it was sort of forgotten for many hundred years. And then came the Russians in the 18th, 19th century, but they didn't do much. And then, in the 1920s, the, the, the big change happened for Central Asia, when the Russian Empire changed and became the Soviet Union. And that is what I'm looking mostly into in this book, is what tra traces do we still have of the past in this book and what traces of the Soviet Union is still visible today in this, this country. So that is why I also gave it the title Sovietistan, because those five countries, they are really, really different from each other. Also geographically, um, Turkmenistan is 80% desert, Tajikistan is more than 90% mountains, um, but they have this in common that they were all part of the Soviet Union, and that is also where these five countries were born as, no, as modern states. 
I could just add uh, that in the in that sense we we make ourselves bridges to use this Venice metaphor. We make ourselves to, into bridges from past to present, just being writers. Uh, there's a similarity there, of course. But then I also was thinking about, um, in this book I have my personal family history as well, and, and that was something that I learned writing about, about it, is that I, I didn't realize it before I wrote it, but my father came to Sweden as a refugee from Budapest, Hungary, and uh, he was young and he started, he learned a new language and a new life and an education and he kept on like refugees do, they look forward, they create a new life for themselves and their children and then he gets me his only child and what do I do in my work? I look backwards. So we sort of back to back, my father looking ahead and I'm looking back and uh, so in a very private way I also become a bridge for past and present to, to connect. So it's, there are several time passages going on at the same time. Yes, uh, another common feature of both um, works. I'm, I, I don't know if you are worried about genre labels. I, I'm just referring to both works as books, other works or books. But another common feature is, that, for example, the fact that, as you said, um, the the life, the personal life, uh, the life of individuals and common, uh, ordinary people, is woven into the fabric of history, so the, with the big age. So, to to what extent? Um, when, when did you, when you set out writing your uh, work? How much of the kind of research you did? was actually part of the original idea and how much uh, did uh, the personal driving force behind the creation of something literary play a role? Okay, I will think when I talk this time. Um, for me, it starts with a strong idea, but well, as, as you noticed from the part that I read to begin with, I just throw myself into this new and unknown world. And of course, I know a little bit before I go and I have the visas that I have to have before I go, but I don't want to know too much before I start doing that physical research, that travel research because I want to be open-minded. I want to receive what there is to receive. I want to see this world, well, not as a child, but as open-minded as possibly. And then afterwards, when I come home, that is when the big research job starts, and that's when I look deeper into the history and society. So it's, it's, a, it's layers, it's a, it's a mixed work, but... Um, now, for instance, I'm starting on a new book about the Himalayas, and I have booked a one-way ticket to Islamabad, 12th of June, and I'm planning to return before Christmas, and that's about it. Yeah. Well, um, I, uh, I mean, I had the idea, the idea came to me about when I read these newspapers and I could see the themes. Uh, but also it's, it's very subjective, this book, and I'm not sure if you recognize that, but I, I work like a historian or an investigative journalist, but I'm not a historian, which gives me a freedom to choose freely. I don't have to know it all and tell it all. And I can also choose my language in another way, uh, freely. So I go very much um, through myself. I choose the themes that I somehow 
aches in me. Um, and that's where I go down. I think for me, this is also, we have completely different um, metaphors for our work. I mean, you actually travel a lot. And for me, uh, but I think we share the both, because then you go down in your subject. But for me, is it's very much going down, like underwater, uh, following uh, a lead, a lead thing hanging down, and I just follow it down like a diver to find what's there. And then I try to put words in it. But also, I think silence uh, means a lot. As I write about, um, partly about the Holocaust, and this is something that is very much described, and we have seen films and streamed series and whatever, and I think that doesn't need to be described much more. It's also undescribable. So I would like to keep my words away from that and still I deal with the subject. So if this was an answer to your question, I have no idea. <laughs> Talking about personal life, for example, there is a the same year, 1947, when I actually, I, I, uh, I read a book when I was probably 22, 23, uh, uh, written by a very important uh, Swedish uh, author, Stig Dagerman. He wrote in 1947, he, Stig Dagerman wrote uh, uh, Tysk uh, the German uh, autumn. And this is actually interesting because it's the same year you describe in your book and it's um, in a way something that I wanted to ask you about, about the fact that uh, this book is a, a reportage that he did uh, when he traveled um, from Sweden to Germany and he witnessed what had happened um, in Germany after uh, World War II. So it's uh, the same uh, starting point with two different questions uh, for you. What, did you when you, when you set up writing your book, did you have any model in mind, uh, for example, literature like this, written in the 50s, 60s, 70s, about uh, countries that people didn't actually know very much about? And a question for you, did uh, Stig Dagerman and, and his, uh, and his uh, work as a journalist as well as a author did he, did he his work play any role in your in your uh, formation as a writer and journalist as well okay. uh, well I'm a social anthropologist by education so I have spent five years uh, reading uh, stories about um, scientists going to Papua New Guinea and the Amazon and to the strangest places on earth and also the earliest works uh, when they are not that politically correct describing the primitive people that they meet. Uh, but uh, the problem with scientists is that it's usually very interesting what they are writing but they're usually not very good writers. So at university you have to read a lot of interesting things but in a very bad language. So I don't have, I mean, I was inspired thematically by this but not really, literally. And I was so happy to get out of the university world and to start writing books. For me that was liberation. Um, one of my greatest idols in the literary world, that is the Polish journalist, Ryszard Kapuczynski, and he was a foreign journalist uh, from, um, in, uh, in the Soviet times, and he has written marvelous books, um, political books from South America, from um, uh, Africa. My favorite book is his book about the Soviet Union. Uh, it's called The Empire, and it's a collection of his travel stories in the Soviet Union. And he was actually a favorite to, to receive the Nobel Prize of Literature, but then unfortunately he died. But that says something about 
the, the poetic style of his language. So it's also, always when I'm writing, it's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the reader and I'm thinking about the language because it doesn't matter how many adventures and how many crazy things happened to me when I traveled in Turkmenistan in the desert. If I cannot make it alive and interesting and vivid for the reader. Yes, and in that sense, I think we, we represent a, a, a new wave, both of us, uh, of trying to make non-fiction into something it hasn't been before. But Kapuscinski, of course, is important. Uh, his genre in Poland is called literary journalism. Uh, and in Germany they call this documentary novel and um, we, have, we have all these genres but I think what's most, what we really have in com common is trying to break down the barriers of genres because reality is much more uh, interesting and complex to be allowed to put in a box uh, like that. But I've had my last book, for instance, which was also historical, it received uh, criticism from Swedish historians when it was first revealed. I had some historical news, things, uh, documents that no one had seen before, so it, it became news material. And the historians were not grateful and not happy, but they were criticizing me. And I had to say, but what are you doing? You, you, if you know things, you have to communicate them. Uh, and at least the historians in Swedish universities, they don't write well enough. So uh, the, the knowledge stays within the institutions, which is a problem, but also makes it possible for people <laughs> like us to take a step forward and do something about it. But Stig Dagerman, he was a fantastic journalist. Uh, so his travels in Germany, the way he sees details, the way he makes, yeah, he's a, he's a, he looks at reality with a very clear eye. So he's an, uh, a very good role model. Is he translated into Italian? Well, read him. Especially at the um, Tusk Coast, the uh, German autumn came out uh, couple of months ago, maybe one month ago. Uh -huh. yes. Well, it's fantastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, really fantastic. And and expanding on this, on the, for example, the thing you said about uh, uh, these stories in Sweden not being grateful. This um, brings us to something in a way similar, which is uh, the kind of balance that there is when writing such things uh, between fiction and the, the history as we know it. Is it something that you had in mind when you um, started writing your books? Was it just uh, about starting and then uh, things began to develop their own way without too much effort to put into it? Yeah, well, the thing is, I always start with the research and I do all the research, I do all the travels and then when I come home I start writing the book. So when I'm traveling I'm just keeping a very, very detailed diary. Uh, but, but I can't write until I have the whole picture. Uh, I can't write until I know what I'm going to write. So I have to go out there into the world to Central Asia and collect the stories before I can tell them. And so, so that means I, I never know what I'm going to write, but that makes it so exciting. That's interesting. I don't really know what I'm going to write, but I do it parallel all the time. Research, write, write, research. It's all integrated. And now I forgot your question. The question was about... I think it uh, was good, but I forgot it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it was uh, about uh, whether you, you had uh, this kind of problem in mind, the, yes. the, the balance between fiction and, and, and history. Yeah. Well, this is, this is 
always a problem when you want to expand a genre and do something else because people start to question, is this the truth? How do you know this? Um, and I think it's interesting because it's a question that fiction never gets. Fiction is in that sense always true, while non-fiction is always carries this question like a shadow, could it be in any other way? So that's a very interesting difference between fiction and non-fiction. We always, we non-fiction writers always have to be prepared to say, it could have been in another way, but this is, this is what I discovered, this is what I found. A fiction writer never has to defend it in that way. If they write a love story that ends in a way, no one says, did that really happen? It's always true. So, there's a paradox here. I think a good way to avoid that problem, and which many Norwegian writers are doing now, is they are, they are writing non-fiction, really. They're writing about their own life, and they call it novel. Yeah. So, then you can write whatever, no one will question. Yeah. Um, but for this book, uh, Sovietistan, which is based on my travels in Central Asia, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't work openly, so that, that was, of course, one... I couldn't work as a journalist. Uh, I couldn't take notes, I couldn't register interviews. So, so most, or a lot of the encounters, the meetings, it's based on what I remember. It doesn't make it less true, but it, of course, makes it a little bit less exact. But to get into Turkmenistan, I had to pretend I was a, a student because it's almost impossible to get um, a journalistic visa. And it was the same in Uzbekistan. Those are two of the most um, authoritarian regimes in the world, second and third to North Korea. And so that created some problems. And I also had to lie to people and keep this appearance of being a student all the way. And I remember when I was crossing the a border from Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan and then always when you're crossing a land border it's a lot of hassle and they were checking all your luggage, looking at all your photos and asking a lot of questions and then so they asked me, so what is your job? Oh, a student. At your age. <sighs> Terrible. When I was your age, I had been working for five years already, feeding my family. So, I suppose you're not married either, are you? Mm. Total failure. But the good thing is that he just accepted me being this huge failure and let me enter the, the country. But, I mean, do you get questioned because of this method? Does, does the truth factor get questioned? Uh, not really, because it's the only only way to work in those countries. And it's also, I think, part of this tradition of travel writing. It's not really... It, it's, it's the way it has been done for many years, that it is this mix of the subjective memory and, and what happened. And in reality, it's just you have to trust that I experienced what I experienced, because it is impossible to go back to that train in Kazakhstan and find that Russian officer who woke me up in the middle of the night with his hand on my lap. You just have to trust that this really happened. Mm. Yeah, This is interesting. I've just been having a workshop for students in, in Copenhagen and I taught them <laughs> that they can write non-fiction in any way they want but it should be based on facts that are checked and checkable. Uh, and that's really the only uh, criteria that I think is important. But uh, now I suddenly realize that this is of course not always possible. Uh, on the other hand, it is one of the few, I mean, it makes interesting next steps. Can one write poetry in that way based on facts that are, con fact that are checked and checkable? You can expand the genre very widely if you have that as a criteria, I was thinking. But maybe I was wrong. Of course, but I think the contract that you have with the reader when you write nonfiction is that it should, should be true. 
but sometimes, like in, in these cases, in dictatorships, you just have to trust the author. And we were speaking of Kapuscinski, and he's a brilliant author, and it's great literature, but can you really trust him? Well, now, in hindsight, it has been discovered that he was describing beautifully um, revolutions where he wasn't present. Exactly. And that, of course, that is very questionable. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no this, is, this is a constant thing. And I've solved, the, I've solved the problem through becoming more and more detailed with my uh, list of sources. Um, very, very detailed. Here I, I list where I've found quotas and I list documents and I list, of course, books I have read. And, um, but this book was, in a sense, easier than my last book, where I took greater liberties in making the facts that I knew were true, I was making them into scenes, uh, as if I was writing fiction. And I didn't uh, declare clearly enough what I was basing my scenes on, but I, they were actually based on facts, but people couldn't be sure. So that was very irritating for me afterwards to take a debate that I, that was so unnecessary for me. And then, well, can you always trust the facts? Um, with dictatorships, it's extremely difficult to know what is true, what is not. For instance, um, if you look at the Turkmen official statistics, they don't have uh, unemployment. If you ask the World Bank, unemployment is 60%. Um, my book was rec recently translated to Russian, and now I am receiving messages on Facebook from um, readers based in Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. Like saying, it's a very interesting book. Everything you wrote about Turkmenistan was wrong. And I had the same experience with the Kazakh ambassador in Oslo. It's the only, Kazakhstan is the only country that has an embassy in Oslo. And after Sovietian was published, well, I didn't really notice that. But then I wrote an article in the biggest Norwegian newspaper arguing that Kazakhstan should have the Olympic Games um, and not Beijing. Well, mainly because Beijing, they don't care about human rights and they don't care if anyone criticizes them, whereas Kazakhstan does. Well, anyway, they were first, they were so thrilled. Someone is writing about Kazakhstan in the newspaper and it's not about Borat. So that was fantastic. Uh, and, and they invited me as a guest of honor to the national celebration. And then he invited me, the ambassador, for a meeting. And, but then he had had the parts of the book and the article translated, and the tone was totally different. So it was a lot more serious and was like, so, Erica, there is a lot of things you have misunderstood about Kazakhstan. And then he listed all these regime-friendly researchers, and did you read this book, and did you read this book? I said, no, no, sorry, not this one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, explains a lot. So next time, Erica, when you're going to Kazakhstan, please let me know, and I will help you. So of course, when I went back to Kazakhstan now, I made any effort <laughs> possible not to let them know I was going. Well, this you don't, you don't get really that problem when you do historic research, because everyone is dead, so. It's <laughs> advantages. But this tells you a lot about, um, about the power of writing, because it's not just about showing things, it's also about narrating things uh, in a way that can be dangerous for them who don't want you to write in a given way. They just want you to, to give a picture of the place that is uh, consistent with uh, their own uh, idea of uh, how they should look like. That's very interesting. And it's about, uh, this uh, brings us to another big question in a way. Um, when I was, I was reading, uh, w one of my, my favorite art, uh, um, authors in Swedish literature is a Per Olof Enqvist. And there is a lot about uh, this kind of, uh, uh, the difficulty of uh, knowing whether what you're reading is actually true or not. So it's a, 
kind of balance between telling the truth and searching for the truth or not. So I, as uh, non-fiction writers, uh, how much do you expect uh, your readers to be, in a way, suspicious? You, you told us about that a little bit, of uh, what you're writing. I don't, I don't know if you see what I mean. Well, Reading literature uh, as, as such. I used to be a journalist, and one of my colleagues in the had a room where he had a sticker on where he said, "Trust me, I'm a journalist." So um, we do, of course, ask a lot from readers and audience. Uh, but I, th I think. As I'm not an historian, I'm not a journalist anymore, I'm, I'm a writer and I can use the sub subjective point of view, which I find that you do as well. You have your eye from the very beginning in your book. I introduce my eye, myself, uh, a bit further in, but that is of course like P.O. Enquist does in different books. He has he's written one book in the 60s, which has been a kind of a role model for me about the Baltic uh, extradition, a, a, a huge dilemma, moral dilemma in Sweden, where there was a lot of Baltic soldiers who'd been on the Nazi side and they had taken refugee in Sweden. And now after the war, Soviet wanted them extradited. So what should Sweden do? Uh, should they protect these Nazis and not leave them to Soviet? Or should, them, should they let them go to Soviet and there they would probably be put in prison or even die, killed? So, a huge moral dilemma, P.O. Enquist wrote about it. And it's an interesting book because he goes like a researcher all through it. And just on the last page, he says, actually in his last sentence, he says, and I don't really understand anything. So that's the first thing he says, first time I think he says, I, and it's in a sentence where he's done all this work to try to understand this, and he finds that he still doesn't understand it. So this is a brilliant way of dealing with it, what is the truth and what isn't. And I think the word I always opens that door to um, to the reader to understand that this is filtered through an individual, a person, a writer. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that having that subjective view expressed in the book, uh, writing it in the first person makes it more clear to the reader that this is your, you're seeing it through your eyes, even if of course that is what the writer is doing anyway. And of course, if you can't check what happened on that train in Kazakhstan, you can check the name of the president in Kazakhstan. There are lots of facts you can check. And it's incredibly important that these facts are correct, because otherwise you will get letters from a reader in a village in the north of Norway who has discovered that the trees you're describing on the Norwegian side of the Russian border is not really the correct tree type, it should be another tree, and so on. So all these details that can be checked should be checked. And I have a wonderful, I mean, all of my translators are wonderful people, translators are wonderful people, uh, but I have a wonderful Polish translator, and it might be in her meticulous Polish mentality, I will not go into that, but uh, when she was translating Sovietistan into Polish, she sent me a long, 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 long list of inaccuracies that she had discovered, and it could be really small things, like this, this uh, prison that you are saying is 5.5 kilometers away from Tashkent in Uzbekistan, but I checked on Google Map and it's 5.8 kilometers. And it was on this level, long, long, long list. So when I was write, finishing my, my latest book, which, was, which will be translated to, and published in Italian next year, it's a book about the border of Russia where I'm traveling through all of the neighboring countries of Russia from North Korea 
to the north of Norway, with all of the neighboring countries, what does it mean to be the neighbor of Russia? Um, then we hired her to check the facts before the book was published. That's brilliant. And, uh, and I know, uh, for instance, a writer in this room who has used uh, uh, a nerd, uh, Joachim Jakobson sitting there writing about Tour de France uh, and found a nerd that knew everything about Tour de France and used him, a person just being a master of all the results and, and bicycle races to check. So these persons are invaluable to uh, other nerds like us. Hmm. Will you tell us about some and tell us well, something about your next uh, work, or maybe the, the one you're working on right now? You, you just said a couple of words about uh, your book, about uh, this uh, journey. Would you like to say something about that? Uh, well, I've been. All my books um, are sort of dealing with Sweden's image and self image. Uh, and even if this is a very European book, I, um, it still has to do somewhat with Sweden's self, self-image. And my next book will be purely about Sweden's identity and values. We have a right-wing populist party who has grown very quickly in uh, Sweden and are becoming very big. And we have an election this autumn. And uh, they have introduced a talk about nationalism and Swedish values, and it has been contagious. So now everybody is talking about nationalism and Swedish values. And um, I'm the child of two immigrants, so I've been looking at Sweden from their eyes. Even though I'm born in Sweden, I've always looked at it from a distance. So my next book is about what is Sweden, uh, what is the illusion of Sweden, and um, we'll see if um, I have to emigrate, or we'll see. Okay, can I just say the title of my book, because it, yeah, I'll just start with the title and then I'll see. Um, I don't think I've done it in English before, so it has a very simple, short title, The Border, and actually I had the idea when I was I had a dream, that was when I was just finishing Sovietistan, and uh, I needed a new project because I don't have a job and I don't have any plans of getting one, so I needed a new idea. And then one night I was dreaming, I was walking on this map from country to country, but north of this red line was always the same country, Russia. So when I woke up I had a title ready, the border and the idea and everything, and I had a plan ready for the next couple of years. And but then I added probably the longest undertitle uh, of last year in Norway. And so the undertitle is a journey around Russia uh, through North Korea, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, Latvia, Estland, Estonia, Finland and Norway, and the Northeast Passage. I think that explains it all. Uh, I think we can, uh, we'll probably come into the, to the very end of this um, very lovely conversation. One last question is about uh, another big thing, I'm sorry. Um, by writing your books, uh, um, is it your hope that uh, this will uh, elicit uh, a response on the part of the reader about the things you're writing on, for example, about Swedish identity and the kind of uh, resonance that th this problem has in Swedish society, and in your case, uh, writing about um, places like North Korea, where democracy is just uh, not present. Is it something that you would like to achieve as writers, the fact that people can uh, react in a way and, and take action as well by by developing a critical a critical uh, uh, attitude towards uh, um, interpreting the the sources we have television books and newspapers 
Okay, uh, I have no illusions that my book will create democracy, neither in Central Asia nor in North Korea. Um, and I don't, I don't really like writers who have like a mission who wants to like change their readers in some way. Uh, but what I love is to inform the readers. And that is basically, and informing myself at the same time. I mean, that's why I wrote Sovietistan, because I knew nothing about those five countries. And I imagine I'm not the only one. And so I was curious about those countries, wanted to learn more. And then my hope is that the readers might be, might get inspired to visit those countries, or they can just sit in their armchair in their own living room and travel comfortably, comfortably without having to drink camel's milk, without having to spend 36 hours on the train in Kazakhstan and so on, but still get a glimpse of this world that is rather unknown to us. I'm very happy I don't have to drink camel milk. Yeah. I must admit, I'm sorry, but, but I, I can't add much because I agree. I don't, I think writers who have a mission, they are often not very good writers. And um, I, I tend to do my books because I want to explore something. Uh, I don't explore them geographically in the way you do, but it's exploration in the same way. So I wanted to explore in this, this book time and, and also the post-war time. And in my next book, I wanted to explore what is this country that I happen to be born in? What is it and how did it become like that? So it's all about exploration, isn't it? We're s explorers. Um, we have time for some questions, if you like, in any language. I'm curious, Erica. Uh, you said that you first travel, you've, you've got to do it all, and then the book begins when you're done with traveling. And yet you said that you obviously keep notes and write down detailed um, accounts of what went on on that given day. I'd like to, to I'd like you to tell us something about the relationship between those notes and then what those notes turn out, turn, turn into. That is to say, what's the relationship between Sovietistans and the bunch, I guess, of paper you've collected? So, so it's a good question. Um, so when I travel, I take detailed notes from every day. Uh, but I traveled altogether five months. So that is roughly, uh, how many days? 150 days. And most of those 150 days, nothing interesting at all happened. Most of those days were really boring, frustrating. Um, I was suffering, but it wasn't an interesting kind of suffering. Um, so when I come home, I have maybe 2,000 pages, and most of that will never be in the book. But then I pick the most interesting, and I usually don't even have to look at the notes to know what will be in the book, because usually what what's interesting to write about is what I clearly remember. So I usually see this scene, this meeting, this landscape, this happening, this is what is interesting. And this also says something about the country. So it's meaningful. Uh, so, so basically I'm taking just a li little part of those notes and sometimes the notes are so well written or so vivid that I don't change much. And sometimes they are I mean, just wo scattered word here and there and it can't stand alone and then I'm filling it in to, to make it literature. Well, 
Well, I do research and write parallel all the time. I can do half a day research and then write the other half of the day. Um, and I think chronology, I, I, I've used chronology as a structure, which is very practical because everyone feels safe with chronology. And that means I can break it up in any way I want to. I can leave it and go very far and still the pace is there. And it's the same when I work. Uh, but when it comes to selection, it's a different process uh, in a way. But I, I go to, the, as I said, the places within myself that hurt somehow. So I have a kind of compass that consists of pain. It sounds very masochistic, but um, it's. I follow that needle where it hurts, and that's where I go in history, in myself. Yeah. Hello, one question from Elizabeth Ospring. I've been reading your book and I think it's fantastic. I think the idea is uh, brilliant and the execution is even more brilliant. I could go on minus talking about this, but my question is, um, your book is chock full of anecdotes. And um, for instance, one of my favorite is about Theronius Monk. And I wanted to ask which is your favorite or which is your favorite character in the book or something you discovered that really surprised you? Well, uh, I, I was constantly surprised because as soon as you lift the lid of a subject and go deep, you find something you didn't know, of course. I like Thelonious Monk part, of course. I like, I think one thing I discovered uh, is also about Christian Dior. Uh, in the process of writing about him and, and the new look that he presents this year. It's, you all know of it, I suppose. It's, it's, Dior presents this very, very feminine look, a silhouette which a lot of material and a very, very thin waist. So women, the, the idea was that a man should hold, be able to hold his hands around a woman's waist. And of course, we all understand that the, this requires a corset. Um, and um, this is great art that he does, and it's interesting enough. But when I also read British newspapers from the same period when Dior is sitting and doing his sketches, I read in the Times, exactly at parallel with Dior, that 10,000 women working in the London underground, the buses, the tubes, they are sacked. It literally says in the Times, thank you for your services. 10,000 women just have to go because the men are back. So this is a year when women are forced into the corsets and they're forced back in the home, in the marriage, in the motherhood, and we get this woman from the 50s that is in a prison, a mentally and psychological prison. Uh, so things like that, I discovered connections that surprised me. I could go on, there are so many. Simone de Beauvoir is another favorite maybe of me, this huge passion she experiences this year, uh, which has direct literary and politically consequences uh, for us today and I won't say anything more so <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions one there hi um, I have a question for Erica because you mentioned that there are uh, many readers who read a book um, they are from Central Asia and they disagree what you described in the book. And I think it's a very interesting intercultural communication problem. And I wonder what's your reaction to uh, those criticisms? Whether you think they're right 
and uh, or you think they are totally wrong. Mm -hmm. well, and why is that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question, but it's quite easy to answer because the criticism has been coming from two sources, from the Kazakh ambassador in Oslo and from Turkmenistan. So, and, and I looked that the messages from Turkmenistan, they were posted in Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is one of the absolutely most unfree countries in the world. So I would assume that those Turkmen criticizers um, are probably working for the government in some kind of propaganda job. And so it's their job to try to correct, um, quite correct um, writings about Turkmenistan. They don't like criticism in dictatorships. Time for one more. <laughs> well, that's the privilege. Um, I'm curious about language, because obviously you said, well, we work on history, we work on travel writing, we work on nonfiction but we do it with a certain language because we do not like, in a sense, Kapuczynski obviously is an exception, um, the way in which these uh, themes and, and let's say subjects and topics are treated linguistically. So how do you work on your language? How do you refine it? How do you pitch it? How do you... Uh, revise to reach the kind of language you want and you need to do what you want your books to do? Uh, well, I had this idea when I started to write my first books that I, I read a lot of non-fiction and I read a lot of poetry. And are these two possible to combine? And why combine them? Well, because poetry, I mean, that is putting as much meaning as possible, in a sense, in one single word, or in the space between words. Uh, silence is also a part of poetry. And this, I find, is interesting, as I deal with memory and memory loss and things like this. Of course, silence is a part of my subject. Uh, so, can I use poetry for non-fiction? And every book is a way of trying to answer it. And uh, so I just keep on trying. I don't have the answer yet. Yeah. I think it's wonderful how you want to combine poetry and non-fiction. I think it's a it's a brilliant idea. I, uh, paradoxically, I, I think it's difficult to put into words how I think when I write, because it's partly it's a very conscious process, and you're looking for synonyms and. Um, okay, so something is wrong with the sentence and, and you're working with punctuation and it can be very technical. Uh, but also, it's uh, just a matter of feeling. Sometimes I can be looking at a sentence for a long time or a page, and like it's something wrong. And then you just, if you feel that there is something wrong, something is not working correctly, something is just in your eye, you should trust that feeling and you shouldn't give up until it's it feels right. Okay, thank you very much for this very lovely, lovely conversation. And if, uh, at, uh, credo si possa, cioè il contacopi, il firma copy, vero? Fuori? Yes. Sì. Quindi chi vuole avere la firma del libro, fuori. Grazie. <laughs>